I'm Patrick Davidson. Recently, CAPS Media collaborated with the Museum of Ventura County on a remarkable exhibit called InnoVision, Ventura County Artists to Watch. For the engaging exhibition, CAPS recorded interviews with nine outstanding artists in the county. Short segments from the interviews are included in the exhibition on display at the museum. For recaps, we're sharing the more complete interviews, where the artists share their personal stories and artistic vision. In this edition of Recaps, the featured InnoVision artist is Daniela Garcia Hamilton. My name is Daniela Garcia Hamilton. Um, I've lived in Oxnard, Port Wainimi for the past three and a half years. And what attracted me to Oxnard once I actually got here was actually the, the richness in Mexican culture. Everywhere I look, I feel like I'm reflected here. So it's a city where I feel that I belong in. As an artist, what is the most important thing you're trying to communicate through your art? I'm trying to communicate the sense of family and the idea that we're all connected in one way or another. How do you define creativity? Uh, creativity is the ability to, it's the ability to fabricate something out of nothing that communicates a message that other people are able to read. Got it. Is there, uh, do creativity and innovation mean the same thing? I think they do. So creating is, again, something that comes from nothing. And then innovation is very similar in the sense that you are trying to make something new. Uh, how does your art reflect who you are as a person? So my art reflects who I am as a person because it communicates the value that I hold dearest, which is my family. Um, and it communicates the complexity of navigating familial relationships um, with external pressures like uh, like immigration and just like the ability to navigate the world while holding on to your connection, but still growing as an individual. Um, how does living in Ventura County fuel your creativity? Um, I feel like I see my family everywhere I look in Ventura County. So it motivates me more to create uh, more work that not only reflects them, but also ref reflects the fact that people like my family and myself exist all over the place. And we're sharing very similar experiences just in different locations. And last please, what vision do you have for the future? My vision for the future is it's a world where art becomes a little more accessible and people that are not familiar with it are more welcomed to be able to come in because they see themselves reflected in the work that's hanging in the walls. So I grew up in the Lancaster Palmdale area, uh, specifically in a little town called Lake LA. And it was a small little desert town. Like I remember the biggest thing I would tell people when they would ask me what it was like is we have one traffic light. <laughs> so it was a very small area. Um, I'm a first generation um, child of immigrants. So both of my parents immigrated from Mexico in the 80s. And I actually spent uh, my first five years as a kid uh, traveling back between Lake LA and my dad's home state of Guanajuato. So I always kind of grew up in like this cultural bubble where that was the only thing I really knew. And it wasn't until I left, went off to college, um, and then eventually met my husband that we ended up out in Oxnard. Uh, that I kind of realized how much of a rarity it was to be that involved in like a culture where it was everywhere. Because when we lived in Long Beach, it felt very much like I like I realized that I didn't really know much about American culture because I was always surrounded by it. And then when I moved to Oxnard, I saw it reflected again, and I was like, oh wow, it really is just like the 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 chance that I had to live in that bubble that it's not as common as I thought it was. So one of the main things that I felt was very uh, different was the music I listened to, the movies I watched, um, just basic like pop cultural references. I didn't know a lot of things and I didn't realize that until I went to college. Like when I m met a lot of people that weren't specifically Mexican American, they would refer to things as simple as like music bands that were not that old, maybe from like the 90s or the 2000s, or they would talk about movies that were considered classics that I had never heard of. Like one of the ones that my husband had told me about was It's a Wonderful Life. I, I didn't, I'd never heard of that movie. And he was like, oh, that's like the American Christmas movie. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> but it was things like that that I realized that a lot of um, the cultural attributes that I knew were familiar just to like my Mexican American heritage. Um, and it didn't really relate too much to 
the American side. It was primarily the Mexican side. It's fascinating. I'm, I'm, I've been here in California my whole life, so I have no orientation to that. Yeah. How does that influence your work, your art? It actually started influencing my artwork a lot once I left Long Beach. Uh, when I was first there and I was getting my undergraduate degree in painting, um, I knew I wanted to focus on something that had to do with immigration. So I started off very literal. It was uh, like immigration policies, um, immigrants that were living on the border, things like that. But I felt like a, a disconnect to it. I didn't really relate to the work as well. And it's when I moved to Oxnard that I realized that what I was missing was my perception of my family traditions and specifically like the circle that I grew up in, that's what was what really was the picture for immigration for me. It was my family and the way that we grew up. And it actually ended up changing the work that I make now. Like my work is all about uh, cultural rituals that I grew up with. Like one of them being like during birthday parties where uh, whenever it's a birthday, like whenever it's a, a child's birthday or an adult's birthday, everybody fights over who gets to push them into the cake. And that was something that I thought, again, was normal. I thought it was just a party tradition until I brought my husband to a birthday party and he was like a little scared and he's like, why is everybody fighting to push that kid in? And I was like, what do you mean? You don't do that? <laughs> like that's, It's very normal. And it kind of made me start to evaluate um, like the reasonings behind that. Like, why is that we do that? And I would talk to my parents about it and they would just tell me like, well, it's always been that way. You know, it's the way that we kind of show love. And it would make me think about the fact that it was it was a violent act, but it's true. Like when I was experiencing it as a kid, I felt this this swirl of emotions that was like excitement, but also anticipation, but then fear because I knew it was going to happen, and then just like overwhelming joy after it did. Uh, are are you the uh, only child? Or you have siblings. I'm actually one of five. I'm the middle child. <laughs> and are you are you are others artists? No, I'm the only one. So like my older brother's like a contractor slash landscaper, like my uh, older sister just, I think she's like a salesperson. She's always kind of done different jobs. And then um, I'm one of just two of us out of the five went to college, but I'm the only one that studied art. And that was a big, that was a big thing when I, when I started studying art, because my parents were not happy with it at first. Like just being a kid of immigrants, like they want you to go for anything STEM because they're the first thing they're thinking of is like financial stability. So when I started doing that, they were just very fearful for like what my future would look like. So it's been amazing to have the opportunity that I've, I've been successful enough that I get to bring them to like events or to art fairs and they get to kind of come in and be like, I didn't know it was this. They didn't, like they weren't aware of what the art world was. But I mean, neither was I until I got into it. And how did you just, first of all, how did you discover you were an artist? What did you want to be? It actually ties back to my relationship to my dad. So my dad has always been somebody who's like a handyman and the kind of person that he was never formally trained in anything, but he was adamant that he could learn to do anything. And I tie it back to like one moment where I was probably somewhere between five or six years old. And I remember in our first house, we had a chimney that was like an old chimney. And he was just talking about how he was going to resurface it. And I remember kind of like looking over his shoulder and he was drawing what the chimney would look like. And it wasn't like a super detailed drawing, but I remember just watching him do it and I idolized him. So it just made me want to try to do it. And after I started as a kid, I just never stopped. That's a great story. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and so what are you doing now? What, what's your particular, uh, it's painting, right? What's your particular medium now? Uh, my primary medium is oil painting. I do a lot of drawing as well, but I've been delving a little bit into mixed media and I've actually started uh, doing embroidery works. That seems like a shift. Explain that to me. <laughs> so I started working with embroidery after my grandpa passed away, and he was like a big pillar in our family. Uh, and when he passed away, it made me just kind of realize how how fleeting time was with like members of family, or just how much I how much I missed them. So I started spending time with my grandmother, and I realized that I didn't know much about her because I was always so close to my grandpa that I didn't know anything really about her. And she started sharing how she worked in textiles, how one of the things that she did was um, sewing for her whole life. And my grandpa actually worked making shoes and I never knew this. And she ended up teaching me how to do like simple embroidery, like cross stitch. And I ended up trying to do the embroidery portraits as a way to kind of create a connection between like what I felt missing my grandpa 
trying to value the time with my grandmother and trying to connect it all into like my practice. Now, is that is that part of the Mexican tradition? So the embroidery is cross stitch specifically is something that a lot of women learn when they're very young. Like my grandma and my mom learned when they were like somewhere around six or seven. And it tends to be like the hobby that they teach you. Uh, it was, and that's actually why my mom never taught me. She didn't want us to be limited to something that was considered uh, specifically for women. And that was the only interest you could have. So she purposefully never taught us how to do that. And that's actually what made me want to learn how to do it when I started spending time with my grandma, where I was like, this is, this is actually very hard, but it's really fun. <laughs> and I remember the first couple of times I did it with my grandma, like she knows I'm a painter and I'm an artist and everything. And I, and I do the portraits, but every time I show her one, she's like, she's like, yeah, you did it wrong. She looks at the back because like with cross stitch, you're, the whole point is you're not supposed to see the string cross on the back. And in my works, I don't do cross stitch specifically. It's just overlapping the string. So the back is specifically like a, like a web, a web of colors overlapping everywhere. And every time I show her one, she's just like, this is, this is wrong. She's like, do you want me to cut it and we can start again? And I'm like, no, Abuelita, it's okay, but thank you. <laughs> and are they, uh, describe, are they, are they, describe what they are? I mean, the, the embroideries have been like a really nice, way for me to meld my drawing and my painting because I've always felt like I was primarily more inclined to drawing and mark making in general and that's something I've always tried to incorporate in my painting but I haven't I hadn't quite found a way to transition the way I drew into the way I painted but the thing I loved about painting was the vibrancy of the color because the color is what ties back to what I visualize when I think about um, all the years I spent like in Mexico with my parents and like all of those home projects we had, like everything that ties back to the root of family is always bright colors. So when I started doing the embroidery, it was a way that I could mix the, the quality of line that you get with pencil using the stitch work, that it creates that angular motion, but then the vibrancy of the string connected them together. Daniela, do you mind describing a bit the three pieces that are going to be in the exhibition? They want to... someone talking behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, so the three pieces that are going to be in the exhibition are both drawings. Uh, they both uh, combine specifically ink and line work uh, with QR codes. And they, the QR codes, when you scan them, they actually take you to a song that inspired the work itself. And it's very telling about what the work is about once you listen to the song. Like for instance, there's a, there's a drawing of like a man that you can't see his face, but he's wearing like a Mexican, it's called a tejana, so like a sombrero. And he's sitting with like a little boy that's emulating the same style and fashion of him. And it's actually a drawing of my grandfather uh, with one of his great nephews, one of the last ones he got to meet before he passed away. And since, again, since my grandpa was such a big part of our lives, like we always did something to honor him in any way. And the, the drawing of him is meant to symbolize how he's still with us, even after he's passed. And the song that you hear when you scan the QR code is a song that my grandpa wanted to hear before he passed away, where he was very sick. And I tried to find the song he wanted. He couldn't remember the name. And I found one that sounded like what he had described. But I remember when I played it for him, he told me adamantly, he's like, that's not the song. And I, I remember I argued with him a little bit and I was like, no, nah, Grandpa, this is it. This is the song. And then he's like, no, that's not it. And when he passed away a couple weeks later, I remember this particular song came on, the one that's in the QR code. And I listened to the lyrics and I realized this, he was right. This was the song he wanted, not the one I was playing for him. And it was almost like a moment where he kind of like tapped back in and he's like, I'm still here. I think that's makes it in some ways better. Maybe. Yeah. In Spanish or English? In, uh, in Spanish. Both of the songs are in Spanish. I mean, it strikes me you have such rich tradition in, in your family and it comes through. And I, I don't have any of that in my family, so I'm jealous. <laughs> I'm, jealous. I'm seriously <laughs> am. Um, and I think that your family must be so proud to see this come through their, their work. It's been, it's definitely been amazing to, to have them come to my shows because I, I realized kind of growing up that art is something that feels otherworldly, um, especially when you're from a culture that's not used to being incorporated in the sense of like the fine art world versus just textile arts or, you know, anything that's functional. So, the whole reason I make a lot of the works 
they're all images of my family and they tell stories of things that are about them. And I try to create the work so that it reads clearly to them. Like they are my target audience. So every time they come to a show and they look at a piece and they automatically are like, oh, that's that's the cake or that's a baptism or th it's like things that they can recognize. And for me, that's enough. Like, that's what I want. I want them to be able to see themselves reflected in something that they felt was inaccessible or exclusive. How do you convey this to your students? To, so <laughs> with my students, I, um, I that's actually kind of funny because I have I teach the advanced placement class. And one of the things they have to do is a portfolio development and they spend the whole year working on that. And the hardest thing that they have to do with that is they have to choose a series of work that they have to follow for 15 pieces, which feels like an eternity for high school kids. They're like they get bored after one. And I always tell them about my work and how the only thing that keeps me going is the fact that what I make is something that I'm constantly thinking about. I'm like the kind of work that's going to keep you motivated, that'll get you through the semester is something that you're truly connected to. It's not about the big ideas. It's not about the political movements. It's about what is it that's important to you and you'll be able to make endless pieces about it. That's really good advice. That's really good advice. Um, and it, obviously what's important to you is your family. Yes. <laughs> I think it's also because I'm, I'm the only one that doesn't live, um, within driving distance of them. So my whole family, they all, when they all immigrated from Mexico, they all actually ended up within 10 miles of each other purposefully. Like they all, my dad has always been like the hub of the family because he helps so many of them. So they all ended up within 15 miles of where he lives. And all of my cousins, my siblings, they all still live there. And I'm the only one that kind of left and didn't really come back. So it's, it's a big part that I miss. Like I spend a lot of time, like free time going over to see them, but I think that's another reason why it's uh, something that resonates a lot in my work is because I feel that even though I'm doing something that is uh, benefiting them, it's advancing all of us as a family, getting everything out there. I still feel like I miss out by not being there. This is uh, Lancaster. Yes. That isn't just over there. That's a bit of a drive. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, we go we go pretty often. We go like every like every other week. We drive out there. Um, are they going to come to the show? I hope so. <laughs> they usually do, so that'll be nice. Like so my parents usually come and they they look around and they just they love seeing works that have anything to do with them. Um, tell me about a couple of pieces in the room. Sure. Um, so the larger piece that's behind me um, is actually about. What I remember from any of the family events that we had, specifically bigger events like weddings, baptisms, like all of that stuff. Like we would always have, like, since my family's so big, we'd have a guest list of somewhere between like 100 to 250 people. Like we had like 250 at my wedding when we got married. And it's very common that when we have these big parties, we tend to see people that maybe we haven't seen in a year or so. And everybody sits around their table. And whenever the camera kind of rolls around, everybody will stand up. And it's always kind of like a, almost like a pose, like military photo where everyone's, nobody's smiling. They're all just close together. And I remember that it's, it's an all day event. Like it starts off at noon and then it ends until about 10 PM. So like the piece behind me here is actually a photo of that, where it's uh, trying to communicate that idea of like my family all put together and they might not look very happy, but they're very happy to be there. And the background is supposed to symbolize the town that I grew up in. So like that blank desert with the high noon sky. And then the dogs that you see in my work, they symbolize a coyote, which is the person who transports people across the border. So in my work, there's usually always a dog because it's meant to be like that reminder that the, the stories and the lives that I experienced, the memories I experienced all began with that first decision of my parents, my uncles, all of them deciding to, to take that trip across, trusting that person to get them across the border. So they become almost like an, like an omniscient, like, like a guardian or somebody that's always there, like as a reminder that it started off because of that one decision. Why did they make that decision? So my dad, um, he decided to come here because even though my grandfather had uh, like agriculture and stuff in Mexico, he always felt that he wasn't going to be able to have the life that he thought he could have. Like he felt like he would be working for my grandpa and he wanted to do more. So that's why he ended up immigrating at the age of 16. And as soon as he got here, he went straight to work. And then my mom uh, came 
because she was actually the primary person that um, was the financial support for her family. So she took care of uh, like her two younger siblings, her my grandma and my grandpa. And she came when she was 16. And by the time she was 18, she had saved up enough money working three jobs to pay for the rest of her immediate family to come over with her. And they both met here in California. So they didn't come from the same village? No, no, no. My dad came from a very small town in Guanajuato where uh, it, it's like kind of what you're describing, like a village. It's like anytime I go to that town, if I walk around the street, people know who I am, even if I don't know them because they know that I'm my dad's daughter and they'll stop me in the street and they'll be like, Alejandro's daughter. They're like, I haven't seen you in forever. Are you, which one are you? You're like, are you Myra or not the Urdani? And I'm like, I'm the one in the middle. <laughs> and my mom's actually the opposite. She's from a big city. She's from Guadalajara. What a rich, what a rich life you're bringing. Yeah. <laughs> um, what have been the challenges? I think the biggest challenge that almost any artist faces is the time. It's the time to be able to dedicate to your practice, especially with how how expensive it is and all of these things. Like when, when you're a painter or any type of artist, um, especially if you don't come from somebody from wealth, you're always working first and then you're spending the time afterwards working on your practice. So that has been probably the hardest thing is working full time and then still coming into the studio every day to try to create the work and like taking advantage of the time that I have. So it's always a balance between, I wanna spend time with my family, but I wanna create the work. What's next? Um, so my next thing that I have is I, I'm gonna have my second solo in LA in Inglewood in September. And that's what all the new work is for. It's gonna be with Residency Art Gallery. Is there a particular direction to that, or is it what? What did they did they commission some things, or is it up to you what you want to do? I don't know how that all works. It's up to me. Yeah. So residency is uh, the gallery that currently represents me. So with my solo, the, I, I love it. They kind of leave it up to me. It's just like September, you're going to do a show, do the show about what you want. And for those of us who don't know your family and you go and see your work, what what do you want our reaction to be? What are you, what are you going for? I want people to come in and see themselves in the family. That's what I always hope. Like my favorite is when people that are not Latino, that are like American or from any other culture, when they see the scenes of people just kind of interacting with each other, like there's like a spark of something that they recognize themselves, like either from an event that they lived or from something that they've heard someone else talk about, where I want them to visualize themselves as part of the party, part of the group of people sitting there just having a conversation around the table. Wow. Yeah. I want to be part of that. <laughs> That's terrific. Uh, the, the only thing I would ask uh, is if you could, you have described one of the three pieces. Yes. Do you mind describing the other two as well? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think what the other two were. The other one is the other QR code with... Um, okay. Yeah. Was it your brother? Oh yes, okay, that's one of them. And then what was and the, the third? One was the, the one that has the double sided embroider. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay. I was trying to remember. Okay. So um the second piece is also another pen drawing and it actually depicts uh almost what looks like golden like metalwork around the edges of it, and it's actually supposed to symbolize a golden cage. And the QR code, when you scan it, it takes you to a song called La Jaula de Oro, which literally means the golden cage. And it's a song that describes the experience of immigrants living in a country undocumented, where they feel like they're living in the land of the riches, but because they're undocumented and the hostility towards them, it feels like they're in a prison because they can't quite navigate the world or the country the same way that documented people can because of the fear of being pulled over or things like that, where they lose everything, even people that are that live here from the time that they're children, they live with that fear. And that's why it's called the golden cage. Um, and the work kind of describes, it describes that feeling, but it also shows the perception that sometimes Americans tend to have about Mexican Americans or immigrants in general, that's not necessarily something that they've chosen to have. Like a lot of the time, the perceptions or the negativity that people have towards immigration, it come, it stems from things like television or things that are subtle that they don't realize is internalized until somebody points it out. And in the scene, you see like a like a young man with a baby watching what seems to be like a simple cartoon. But the cartoon that they're watching is what Looney Tunes depicted as Mexicans being, which are two drunk little mice wearing sombreros and being lazy. 
And in reality, when you're a kid watching the cartoons, you just think it's a fun thing, but those thoughts eventually become internalized. And then as an adult, you grow up thinking, well, immigrants are just here being lazy, wasting resources. And it's like those thoughts come from somewhere. They stem from something. And it tends to be subtle things like that that grows the seed. And the embroidery piece? The embroidery piece is actually a double-sided one, um, and it's called chameleon. And it's actually a description of myself when I was a kid about the, the struggle to kind of fight when teachers and adults in the U.S. were kind of forcing us to assimilate to the culture. That was the biggest thing when I was a kid, where when I would come to school and I didn't speak English until I was about like in third grade. So I was always struggling a little bit. So I, would, I tended to gravitate towards kids who spoke Spanish. And when we would speak Spanish or talk about our stuff, like I remember teachers would tell us like, no, you got to speak in English or like kind of pushing us to be towards one way or the other. So when I was a kid, I loved sports. I liked baseball, but my favorite was soccer. And I remember that I would always wear like Dodger jerseys because I knew it was the thing that was easier to kind of flow around. And it was the thing my parents pushed to because they wanted us to fit in. But what I wanted to wear was my Mexican soccer jersey, even though that was the one that they would discourage me from wearing. So the boy in the piece, um, on the front side of it, it just shows him with his face um, and a Dodger hat fully embroidered in clear perspective. And his shirt is actually showing the backside of a second embroidery where it just looks like a tangle of colors. But when you flip it around to the other side, it shows the soccer jersey in full detail. Brilliant. Brilliant. And your grandma can't complain. <laughs> wow. Um, having that, having that laid upon you by, you know, as a child, I'm amazed. I would, I would be really angry about it. <laughs> it ends up being kind of, um, and I've talked to other kids from different cultures, like whether it's from like, you know, Asian immigrants or other things. And it's a very shared experience, specifically like it was pushed a lot harder in the 80s, I think. 80s through like the 2000s is like this group of kids, like this is what we were told. We were told that we shouldn't, we shouldn't be who we are because we're now in a new place and the best way for us to fit in is to try to mirror them. But the reality is we never looked like them. So no matter how much we tried, we would always be identified by what people perceived us to be. And that's why I love to see kids now that are a lot more willing to kind of like embrace their culture. And a lot of teachers or people in general have kind of realized the error in what they were doing. So it becomes more where they're trying to nurture kids and trying to push them back into it because it turns into this effect where as kids, they want us to be American. So they push us through all these things. But then when we get older, like teenagers or young adults, we start to reflect a lot of those American ideals that they wanted us to have. But our parents still hold the original ones. So then it becomes a clash where they, they complain that we don't speak enough Spanish, where we're not holding the values that they, they said that they taught us, but it was constantly a push and pull. It's like, you wanted us to be more American, like this is kind of what it is. But now that we're older, now it's the opposite where it's just like, don't forget where you came from, like your roots are where it really matters. So it's always been being taught like a tug of war growing up in it. it. Sounds like you reflect that in your art as well. Yes, I'm, I'm very fortunate. My parents, even though they, they did a little bit of the tug of war, they, they always emphasized the fact that we were always gonna be immigrants. Like, no matter where we went, that was going to be the first thing people were going to see. So you might as well embrace it. And is there a pride in that? A hundred percent. Yeah. That's like my number one, I think, thing that whenever people ask me, it's like, I'm, a, I'm, I'm very proud to be a kid of immigrants. Like, my parents came here with nothing. They built the wealth that they have. And it was because of the sacrifices they made that, I was, that I'm able to even participate in something that is as exclusive as the art world. Because it is.